Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Catherine, and I will be serving as your moderator. The presentation today is entitled, Strategies for Managing the Oncoming Tsunami of Data. We all know that over the next several years, data volumes will skyrocket. What has not been made clear until recently, though, is that there simply won't be enough storage on Earth to store it all. Over the next 55 minutes, we will discuss strategies for addressing this data deluge by leveraging a streaming data architecture. We are honored to have as our first speaker today, Alex Woody, Managing Editor of Datanami. Alex has covered the high-tech and IT industry as a technology journalist for more than a decade, focusing on emerging trends in systems, storage, software, business intelligence, cloud, and mobility. Joining Alex is Steve Wilkes, co-founder and CTO of Stream. Steve has served in several technology leadership roles prior to founding Stream, including heading up the Advanced Technology Group at Golden Gate Software and leading Oracle's cloud data integration strategy. Throughout the event, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A panel located on the left-hand side of your screen. Alex and Steve will be answering questions throughout the presentation and will address as many as possible after the presentation wraps up. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Alex Woody. Thank you for that introduction, Catherine. We're all tired of the term big data, but uh, it accurately describes the problem as well as the technology solutions that we've created to deal with it. Stream asked me to provide some background in the history of where we are today, and uh, that's what I intend to do. So it all started back about 25 years ago in, in the mid-90s with the growth of the Internet. It was clear at the time that uh, it would eventually have a major effect on our lives, but we didn't know exactly how it would all transpire. But we knew that it would be big. Looking back on the past 25 years, a pattern has emerged. As more people built things on the Internet, it drove a need for bigger and better technology, bigger disks to hold all the data, better processors to process the data, and faster networks to move all the data. As the hardware improved, so did the software, much of which uh, was open source. From web servers and databases to operating systems and search indexers, a unified stack began to emerge, starting with the LAMP stack of Linux, the Apache web server, the MySQL database, and PHP, Python, Perl, in addition to JavaScript, HTML5, CSS, and JSON. And these technologies supercharged the productivity of web developers to meet our demand for even bigger and, and better websites. As the web development tools solidified and got easier to use, the web exploded. In 2000, when Doug Cutting released his Lucene search engine as an open source project, they were on the order of about a million websites in the world. That was a great increase, to be sure, from the early 90s, when they were basically zero. But it's a far cry from where we are today. As the number of websites surpassed uh, more than one billion, or one unique website for every seven people on the planet, uh, by 2014, that's where we got. In, re in retrospect, this time presented a great flowering of technology, and it was, in my view, the origin of today's big data tools. As the e-commerce engine started to move ahead, it exposed gaps in the technology of the day. The web giants of Silicon Valley saw it first. And it all started with an extension to Cutting's flagship search engine. Doug Cutting and his colleague, Mike Caffarella, set out to build an automated web crawler to index the Internet to improve search results. The resulting product, called Nutch, could crawl 100 pages a second. That was lightning fast at the time, but because it was limited to running on a single machine with about a terabyte of disk and 100 gigs of RAM, which was pretty beefy for the time, it had a hard limit of about 100 million web pages. It soon became clear that that wouldn't be nearly enough, so Cutting and Caffarella decided to paral paralyze it. They managed to expand Nutch to four nodes before the system became too complex to handle, and it still wasn't enough to handle the expected growth of the web. The, the, the developers weren't sure how to proceed until they finally stumbled across an obscure paper written by Google that described the Google file system. Here they found the blueprints for solving the same problem that they were dealing with. In 2004, using the paper as their guide, Cutting and Caffarella developed a Java version of the Google file system, which they called the Nutch Distributed File System. Guided by another Google paper, they, descri they described 
that described a system for parallel processing called MapReduce, Cutting and Caffarella created the first processing engine to work with the new file system, which Cutting would soon rename Hadoop. When Yahoo caught wind of the developer's work in 2006, it hired Cutting to help it compete against the upstart Google. Yahoo finally went live with Hadoop in 2007. Hadoop's early days were a mix of success and failures. The new system could scale like nothing before it, but it was a different beast entirely, and it required constant attention. While there were other distributed computing frameworks in active development at the time, Hadoop gained the lion's share of the attention from prospective users. It also had a liberal license at the Apache Software Foundation, which probably helped it spread. And spread it did. By late 2007, most of the web giants in Silicon Valley had heard of Yahoo's success with Hadoop, and they were starting to use it. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they all innovated atop Hadoop and developed products that would soon become top-level Apache projects of their own, including Hive, HBase, and Storm. Facebook also developed Cassandra, a documented-oriented database based on, the Dy on Dynamo, a key-value database created by Amazon.com in 2004 to handle holiday shopping traffic. The development of NoSQL databases has largely paralleled the rise of Hadoop. Hadoop flourished in the ensuing years. Cloudera was founded in 2008, and with it, the big data concept of bringing the compute to the data migrated out of Silicon Valley and into enterprises around the world. Cutting would join Cloudera a year later to help guide the development of the fledgling computer system that was so green and yet had so much potential. The Hadoop dream of providing a central data store for a variety of engines was a tantalizing one. Since the dawn of time in IT, we've been struggling with the need to move data to the computing resources. Storage servers remain separate from processing servers, and never the twain would meet, except perhaps over expensive 10 gig networks, or if you happen to work in the HPC field in a Finiband network. Hadoop appeared on the scene like a silver bullet, prepped to tackle every data storage and processing task we could throw at it. Its appearance in 2007 occurred just in the nick of time to handle a huge uptick in unstructured data driven by the mobile web that occurred just after Apple introduced the iPhone in 2007 and the searching success of social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Or perhaps Hadoop's presence enabled this explosion of video chat logs, music files, and cat pictures. It's really a chicken and the egg problem, and nobody will ever know if the explosion of data and consumer-based information sharing would ever have happened had we not suddenly been graced with the ideal combination of cheap storage and compute embodied by Hadoop. In any event, while the web giants were the biggest early buyers of Hadoop-style computing and the biggest contributors to the growing Hadoop stack, they were soon followed by their enterprise brethren. Banks, retailers, travel companies, insurance companies, and manufacturers soon wanted to process data like the web giants did. After all, why should Google and Facebook own the consumer data and therefore drive all the transactions? The idea that we're all software companies now soon took hold, and the big data explosion continued to roll. Armed with nearly unlimited data storage measuring into the petabytes, data, science, and data scientists trained on machine learning techniques, companies were determined to find hidden insights in the form of unexpected correlations or, or anomalies that they could turn into business advantage. Harvard Business Review declared the data scientists the sexiest job of the 21st century. Hadoop, for better or for worse, was basically synonymous with big data. If you're, quote, doing big data, unquote, then you're probably using Hadoop. With this novel schema on read approach, Hadoop was hailed as a new data warehouse that didn't penalize you for ingesting and processing huge sums of semi-structured and unstructured data that would never fit into a relational data warehouse like the ones from the old guard companies like Teradata, Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, and HP. However, chinks started to appear in the Hadoop armor. While the platform could ingest huge sums of unstructured data like nothing else and survive failures of multiple nodes, the design of HDFS thwarted real-time or near-real-time workloads. It was, for better or for worse, a batch-only paradigm. Apache Hive and other SQL-based warehouses for Hadoop introduced interactive SQL processing into the ballgame, but that didn't eliminate all performance concerns in the new data lakes. But batch and in early interactive processing simply didn't work for certain types of workloads. Fraud detection on credit card transactions, for example, requires subsequent responses to queries. Surfacing a product recommendation on an e-commerce site also requires having an answer within a certain amount of time. Early versions of Hive with its MapReduce batch dependencies was ill-suited for these types of workloads. 
the demand for fast data analysis spurred the creation of a new class of data processing engine, separate from Hadoop. The pack was led by Apache Storm, which Twitter developed to analyze huge numbers of tweets in something closer to real time. LinkedIn had its own real-time processing engine called Samza, which it developed alongside its real-time data pipeline called Kafka. Yahoo developed its own projects called Samoa and S4. The parallel development of these real-time big data engines created a problem, of course. If Hadoop was the single version of the truth, as it was advertised to be then, how do you manage the separate streaming platform? The problem gave rise to a new architecture by Nathan Mars, the creator of Storm, called Lambda. Put simply, the Lambda architecture simultaneously splits all data and feeds it into two separate systems, one that flowed into the real-time streaming system for real-time decision-making, and another one that flowed into Hadoop for end-of-the-day batch processing to account for late-arriving files and any errors that cropped up with the real-time system. Needless to say, stitching together two separate systems based on different frameworks that use different programming paradigms increased the complexity level immensely. Despite the fact that Lambda was seen as the only way to satisfy the competing requirements of processing data in a way that's simultaneously fast, thorough, and efficient. Any history of big data storage would be remiss if uh, NoSQL databases weren't mentioned. NoSQL databases have some of the same characteristics of Hadoop. <clears throat> they both give developers flexible schemas and different query me mechanisms besides NoSQL while helping administrators by being distributed and fault tolerant and running on cheap clusters of x86 computers. NoSQL databases, however, provide functions above and beyond what you get in a flat file storage system, which Hadoop mostly is. NoSQL databases are mainly used as operational data stores for structured and semi-structured data, like JSON, as opposed to the data lake for semi-structured and unstructured data, which is Hadoop's biggest use case. Just as we've seen a proliferation of engines that plug into Hadoop, we've seen the rise of specialized NoSQL databases designed to handle specific tasks. We've seen key value stores like Memcached and Redis excel at serving read-heavy workloads, such as uh, travel websites, while document stores like MongoDB and Couchbase excel at serving backends to most of the world's po most popular web and mobile apps. Wide column stores like Cassandra dominate the most intensive scale-out use cases, while graph databases like Neo4j and TitanDB pr provide an entirely new twist on data processing through degrees of connectedness. At the same time, other NoSQL no databases, such as Splunk, Elasticsearch, and MarkLogic, serve even more specialized use cases. In, a, in addition to the Hadoop stack, the stream processing systems and the NoSQL databases, you have object stores to contend with as well. An object store treats every piece of data as an object, as opposed to a file system like Hadoop, or a block storage method like SAN storage. It sometimes is considered the simplest and most scalable data storage method. Each record is given an identifier, which is stored in a metadata store, while the object itself is stored in the cluster. Amazon's S3 today is the most dominant object storage system by far, and the S3 API is a standard adopted by other storage systems as well. Together, the NoSQL databases, Hadoop, st the stream processing systems, and object stores seem poised to upend the status quo in the $2 trillion IT industry. While NoSQL databases process transaction, Hadoop provides the insights through machine learning workloads. Stream processors deliver the instantaneous insights, while huge data lakes filled with uh, videos and pictures would be efficiently stored in object stores. With all the big data pieces in place, it was just a matter of putting them all together. And yet the innovation didn't end. As the big data sets continued to grow, so did the number of big data projects designed to help process it all. The hype surrounding Hadoop peaked around 2014, which incidentally is the same year that Apache Spark emerged from incubator status to replace large parts of the Hadoop stack. The death of MapReduce as the primary engine of Hadoop was relatively swift. And today, Spark is the de facto standard processing engine for a range of big data workloads in Hadoop, including stream processing and machine learning while Spark's graph and SQL processing capabilities are, are quickly maturing. And yet, innovation still hasn't slowed. Today, we're seeing the rise of other frameworks, like Apache Flink and Apache Beam, that advocate a stream-first approach to big data. Instead of running separate Hadoop infrastructure in a Lambda architecture, Flink and Beam propose that we process all data, even batch-oriented data, as if it were real-time. This approach has a number of benefits, including the elimination of the Lambda architecture and the simplification of the stack. And considering the huge amount of data that the Internet of Things is predicted to generate in the coming years, it may be the only way to keep our head above water. 
As much as people seem to hate the term big data, the term still has legs. And why? It's because the term aptly describes the core of the problem we face. Because managing the data, including storing it, accessing it, governing it, cleansing it, securing it, and ultimately turning it into useful information, ultimately is a big data problem. Consider the growth of data that we've experienced up to this point. In 2003, the world generated on the order of five exabytes of data. By 2006, two years after Facebook ignited the social media revolution, data generation exploded to 161 exabytes, according to the IDC. By 2010, three years after the first iPhone reached the consumer hands, people and their devices cracked the zettabyte barrier for the first time. The exponential growth continued in 2014 when we created 4.4 zettabytes of data. That was about the, as many bits generated as there are stars in the physical universe, according to the IDC. By 2016, the world was generating 16 zettabytes of data per year. Those are huge numbers to be sure, but here's the rub. Most of that data is never stored. According to the IDC, our ability to manufacture storage capacity trails far behind our ability to generate data. The key number here is 15%. That's the fraction of data that we generate that ultimately gets written to disk or tape or flash drive or optical or cloud or any other permanent storage uh, mechanism. Most of the data we have created up to this point has been ephemeral. The bits that make up our telephone calls, the TV and radio signals that are broadcast and never written down, the HTTP requests that fetch data into our apps and browsers that we that we eventually close and forget about. In, in many ways, our world has always resembled Snapchat. Data is fleeting, appearing and disappearing in our lives to suit our whims and needs. The Snapchat-like trend will continue with the Internet of Things. The IoT is widely expected to supercharge our data generation capability to a mind-boggling 160 zettabytes per year by 2025, according to IDC's most re recent data age report. Storage manufacturers are doing their best to keep up with the huge growth. Hard drive makers are building bigger and better hard drives, including 5 terabyte drives today and 30 terabyte drives on the roadmap, while tape manufacturers are shipping 6 terabyte LTO cartridges today with 48 terabyte cartridges on the roadmap. Despite the innovation in spinning disk, solid state, tape formats, and cloud storage, the IDC predicts our storage capacity to hold steady at roughly 15% of the data we generate. That number, 15%, appears to be some sort of magic number, reflecting in a way the ratio between the raw data of questionable value and the actionable information that we're willing to invest in. The question then becomes how best to extract that 15% kernel of value from the other 85% of chaff. Will we write 100% of it temporarily to disk with the hopes of whittling it down to 15% that we value through some sort of map reduce method? That approach seems unlikely. While it had a shot of work in 2004 when Google researchers Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Gemawat published the seminal MapReduce paper, there's almost no chance of it working with the gargantuan data of today. While Google was the f source of inspiration for both core components of early Hadoop, including the Google file system that Cutting would implement in Java as HDFS and the original MapReduce method, it has long since moved beyond that form of computing. So what did the mighty Google replace MapReduce with? Why stream processing, of course. In 2014, the company revealed cloud data flow, a new big data software development and execution paradigm designed to enable developers to build data flows or pipelines that, produce, that uh, process exabytes worth of data. At this point, I think I would like to ask our first polling question. We would like to know what the state of stream processing is in your organization. Do you have any plans to implement it? Do you have plans to implement it within a year, within one to two years, or beyond two years? Or do you have no plans to implement it, or have you implemented it already? We're going to wait just a little bit here while everybody takes the poll, and we can collect the results. All right, well, it looks like we have about 15% of you have already implemented stream processing. About 15 have plans to implement within a year. About 23 within two years. Nobody with long-term implementation plans, and uh, roughly half of you have no current plans. 
One of the current tenets of uh, Google Dataflow, which has uh, turned into Apache Beam, is the unification of batch and real-time data processing. While Dataflow ostensibly enables developers to process data as soon as it comes off the wire, usually Apache Kafka or Amazon's uh, analog to that called uh, Kinesis, Google realized that the same technique can also be used for batch processing, thereby eliminating the need to build and maintain separate systems as for the Lambda architecture. <clears throat> With Apache Beam, developers can write batch and streaming applications by utilizing a single API. What's more, thanks to the notion of runners, developers can access other execution frameworks from within the Beam API, including Flink, Spark, and, um, and Apex, as well as the Cloud Dataflow engine living on the Google Cloud engine. This brings us up to the present. The state of big data is still in flux and evolving at a tremendous pace. The data generated by the IoT is exploding. Instead of petabytes of data, which we used to think was big data, now individual companies are take, talking about storing more than an exabyte of data, while worldwide storage of data is measured into zettabytes. To keep up with this massive generation, we're moving beyond batch-based methods embodied by Hadoop and its file system. Today, the future is clearly focused squarely on real-time data processing methods at the edge, upon mobile devices, and using new hardware form factors, because it's really the only chance that we have to keep our heads above the digital tsunami. That completes uh, my presentation, and uh, I'm going to hand it on over to Steve. Thank you, Alex. So I just want to kind of reiterate what Alex was saying and show it you in a, a graphical f form so it really hits home. And hopefully those of you who aren't thinking about stream processing will be convinced that you may need to. So today, we're around 16 zettabytes of data annually, as Alex mentioned. And by 2025, IDC is estimating 160 zettabytes of data. Just to put that into perspective, in an exponential graph, that means that in every two-year period in this graph, uh, more data is generated during those two years that was generated in the entirety of mankind's life on Earth up until that point. So every two years represents more data than was ever generated before, which is, to me, just quite amazing. Um, of that data, right now, IDC is saying around 5% of it needs to be dealt with in real time. And by 2025, around 25% of that data will need to be real time. Um, and of that real time data, 95% of it will be generated by IoT. And that's a massive increase. Uh, you can see the exponential curve, it wasn't really starting to hit um, for the real-time data until now. And by 2025, we're going to be overwhelmed with the amount of data being generated. And as Alex mentioned, only a small percentage of that data can be stored. Now, if only a small percentage of that data can be stored, then you have no choice. The only logical conclusion is that you have to process and analyze data in memory in a streaming fashion in order to deal with the huge amounts of data that are being generated. Now, it's not just IoT data that is, is streaming. And as, as Alex mentioned, there is this trend to move towards a, a, a streaming-first architecture. And if you think about it, it's, it's quite natural. And batch is actually quite artificial. Um, everything that happens within an enterprise happens because of some event, because something happens. It could be a user typing something into a form that puts stuff into a database. It could be a web application that's writing to a database. It could be web applications that generate web logs. It could be machines doing stuff that generate logs. It could be devices that are sending things as events as those things happen. But all of it is happening one event at a time. Log files aren't created a whole file at a time. They don't wait until everything's done and then write everything to a log. Databases don't always work, you know, huge numbers of rows at a time, they typically, you know, row by row, insert by insert, update by update. So uh, databases um, can be streaming through change data capture. Logs can also be streaming by reading at the end of the log and taking things as they're written. And devices obviously can also be streaming. So I hope to convince you that stream processing is a major infrastructure requirement. And it can also be the precursor to everything else you're doing. Um, and the only real limitations on turning a streaming architecture to you know, applying batch concepts within it, because some things have to be batch, right? Your, 
end of day report needs to be done at the end of the day. Um, the only real limitation to that is memory. The more RAM you have, the more data in a streaming fashion you can contain, and the larger your in-memory batches can be that you're doing through stream processing. But there's no real requirement, if you have enough memory, to store all of this stuff on disk. So some of the things that you might be thinking about doing, we'll talk about how you can think about that in a streaming fashion. Right? If you're creating a data lake, the first thing you have to think about is kind of what is the end goal? You know, what is the point of creating this data lake? What's the information that's going in it? And the, you know, Alex is reporting on, other people have reported on kind of some of the failures that have happened with Hadoop um, and some of the approaches that have been taken that were just completely wrong. And the overall completely wrong approach is to throw everything in there in a raw fashion and kind of hope for the best, kind of hope you're going to get some value out of it later. So thinking about your end goal is kind of the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, how does it scale? Um, Hadoop queries are slow. You compare Hadoop queries with a well-architected uh, data warehouse, the query is incredibly slow. Um, in order to speed that up, you need to think about what does the data look like when you put it in Hadoop. And typically, raw data isn't the best thing to put into Hadoop from a querying perspective. You need to be able to pre-process it um, and enrich that data, add, denormalize it in a database terminology in order that when you query it, you can get your queries results back fast. And you also have to think about, do we need all of the raw data? Is it the best form? Should we instead be doing aggregates and writing aggregates into Hadoop that also facilitate fast queries? So think, you know, is the raw data actually useful? Um, and then how, do, how does it scale? Um, how do you scale feeding it? You know, putting things into Hadoop, you need to think about the overall architecture, um, the three, four, five, six, seven Vs of, of big data really do need to be considered. Um, and how do you sc scale storing it? Is this something that you want to do on-premise or you want to do in the cloud? And it turns out that you know, AWS is currently the top Hadoop distribution and it's in the cloud. So that's also something to consider. Uh, the other thing you might be considering doing is providing streaming data as a service. And organizations are investing in Kafka, for example. Now, if you're investing in Kafka, again, you ask yourself the question, what is the end goal? Because Kafka is just a message queue. And message queues have been around for a long time. Now, MQ series has been around for decades. So if you're putting stuff onto a message queue, why are you doing it? Do you want to do real-time analytics? Is it something that you're using to feed your data lake? Are you expecting people to do self-service analytics on stuff that you've written into Kafka? And again, you ask yourself the question, is the raw data itself useful? Um, if you're putting data onto Kafka, imagine you're doing change data capture from a database, and you're feeding that raw data into Kafka. If you have a nicely normalized database, then the majority of your data is going to consist of IDs. Your customer order detail table change, someone added a row to it, is going to contain your customer ID, order ID, item ID, some timestamps, something else. Um, all of those IDs are not going to be useful for someone doing analytics on a message queue or delivering even into a data lake. So you probably need to do enrichment of that data before it even makes sense. And then how do you integrate. If Kafka is just a message queue, how do you get data in and out of it? Um, how do you integrate it with your existing investments, you know, like databases? And how do you get value out of it? How do you perform the in-memory analytics um, and processing and even create dashboards from it to actually give value to your end audience? So we'd recommend that if you're trying to do any of these things, you, know, you don't boil the ocean. You don't try and do everything in one go. You don't throw all of your raw data into Hadoop. You don't throw all of your raw data onto a message queue. You literally take things one stream at a time and do this as part of your overall business goal. You would identify business use cases that make sense for these types of architectures. And the streaming piece is part of your overall data architecture. It doesn't immediately replace everything you have. It coexists. You probably already have 
uh, an operational data store, enterprise data warehouse. You probably already have ETL jobs that run in batch mode that are taking things from databases and or files and putting those into a data warehouse, putting those into Hadoop, right? So this streaming architecture, yes, eventually um, it can supplant a lot of those things, but that's not something you want to do in one go because these things are already working and they're already part of your, your enterprise, already part of your decision-making process. So streaming integration can be applied one stream at a time. You can connect it into your databases using change data capture. You can read log files in real time. You can also access um, other machine data, message queues, sensors, etc., and do all of this uh, streaming architecture. And those can drive real-time applications. Those can allow you to do real-time analytics. They can also feed data to machine learning so the machine learning can learn, but then they can use machine learning uh, models and do real-time scoring uh, as part of the streaming integration piece. They can also read and write data from data warehouses and uh, Hadoop um, and also use data in data warehouses, databases, and Hadoop uh, for enrichment purposes. So load all your reference data that you may have lying around in these things into memory and make that part of your streaming architecture. And so this is kind of uh, an enhanced version of, uh, of Lambda. Other people have talked about kind of a Kappa architecture where you're um, keeping kind of time windows in memory that kind of replace batch. Um, but if you are moving everything towards kind of a streaming architecture, we may as well call it kind of the Omega architecture because you can't go higher than that in the Greek alphabet. So Stream is a complete end-to-end uh, -end platform. I'll just introduce kind of what Stream does a little bit to give you some context around how some of these things can be done. And we do both streaming integration and analytics. Now, all these things apply to Stream. These are things you should be considering if you're looking at moving towards streaming. So first thing is you need to do continuous data collection, and not just from IoT devices, but also from message queues you may have. That could be Kafka, it could be Flume, it could be MQ series, it could be JMS. You probably already have investments in those things. And it could also uh, log files, as I mentioned, can be read in a streaming fashion. Uh, sensors typically are inherently streaming. Um, they're sending data continually. Um, but databases can also be streaming through change data capture. Uh, stream processing is an essential part of this architecture. You need to be able to do in-memory filtering, transformation, aggregation of data, and as I mentioned, enrichment is key. You need to be able to load context and reference data into memory and join that with the streaming data in real time in order to actually get value out of your streaming data. You need to do stream analytics and uh, anomaly detection, uh, what used to be called complex event processing, looking for patterns, sequences of events over time that might indicate something interesting is going on. Uh, do the statistical analysis and compare uh, real-time data with statistics. Integrate machine learning and do that in real time. And be able to visualize all of this and create dashboards around it to actually get value out of it. And then, of course, you need to be able to deliver your results of this processing. And that could be putting aggregated data or enriched data into Hadoop into Kafka, or delivering into the cloud, putting it into S3 or, or Redshift or Azure SQL. Um, so you need to think about all of these pieces if you're embarking on uh, stream architectures, and you need to think about how do all these pieces fit together, and how do they make sense. Uh, there are different categories of business use case that you can solve using a, a streaming architecture. And we break those down into kind of real-time data integration, detecting patterns, and also monitoring and building metrics and KPIs. Um, here's just some examples. You could be feeding your data lake in real time or feeding your uh, Kafka or other message queue infrastructure in real time. You might be migrating data into the cloud or setting up a real-time hybrid cloud where data on-premise is mirrored in the cloud for reporting or scalability um, purposes. Or you might be looking at IoT edge processing, um, doing pre-processing of data, uh, doing aggregation, redundancy removal, extracting the signal from the noise, turning data into information, and doing that at the edge. On pattern detection and anomalies, there's a lot of things you could be doing here, uh, whether it's fraud detection or kind of active 
cybersecurity monitoring, anti-money laundering, doing things based on locations, doing predictive maintenance in real time, and a lot of the IoT analytics. And then kind of building on that, uh, if you're looking at building and monitoring metrics and KPIs, then you start to think about real-time call center or network quality monitoring, uh, point of sale monitoring, general SLAs, if you're providing APIs, APIs or other uh, SLAs to your customers and monitoring those in real time and seeing if you or your customers are breaking them. Um, and there's a lot of things that you could be doing here as well. So I'm going to take a quick pause here and we're going to ask the next survey question, which is around what type of use cases are you or would you think of as being useful for uh, streaming our architectures. And we'll wait a short time for those survey results to come in. And I would encourage you to kind of answer this. It's kind of uh, uh, interesting to see, and it will kind of help uh, target some of the things we talk about later um, as we go through the rest of the presentation. So while those results are coming in, um, you hear a lot of talk about stream processing. Uh, you hear it coming from a, you know, a lot of different vendors and a, uh, you know, even kind of uh, Kafka vendors and people that are focused on, on, on message queues are talking about kind of stream processing. Well, there are a lot of different components to a stream processing architecture. Yes, a message queue like Kafka is an important aspect of that, uh, but it's only one tiny sliver of the entire architecture. You need to consider how do you uh, load large amounts of data into memory. That's an in-memory data grid that you need in order to actually do that side of things. Um, you need to think about how do you do your stream processing? How do you do your analytics? How do you integrate with machine learning? How do you visualize um, all of this? Where do you store the results? Where do you push them? Is that something you need to consider as well? And then, of course, how do you collect the data, whether it's uh, you know, real-time from devices, message queues, log files, and also databases through change data capture. And then how do you deliver that data out to somewhere, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise? So yes, Kafka is an important aspect of your uh, stream processing, but there's a lot of other pieces of technology that you'll need as well. So we've got a lot of the results through now for what are you considering stream processing for, and Interestingly, but not unexpectedly, IoT and machine data seems to be um, the top. Uh, people are actually also looking at it for uh, log intelligence, real-time monitoring of, of machine logs, uh, recommendations, fraud detection, um, and then we have some others, which we would obviously be interested in drilling down. Um, if you have one of those others, then you can email us and kind of let us know what the others is. That would be great. So let's go back to the slides. Um, I'm going to zoom through uh, the next one and get on to kind of the IoT portion. This is just a reiteration of kind of the pieces that you need in a uh, streaming architecture, and this is the stream platform. Uh, one of the things that we do that's kind of key to success, I think, is we lower the bar uh, drastically for people wanting to build uh, streaming data flows. And we do that by doing all of the stream processing through SQL. So you can write continuous queries, continuous uh, processing in memory through SQL without having to learn how to code in JavaScript or Java or C Sharp or any of the other uh, programming languages you may need. Um, and we're also an end-to-end -end platform that contains all of these pieces. So you don't have to choose and evaluate and work out which um, message infrastructure you're going to use, which caching system you're going to use, which storage you're going to use, and how you get data in and out of all of this, and then how you do the processing and analytics. So those are kind of the key uh, aspects of a streaming architecture, and this is kind of how we put them together at Stream. And we also add this overall kind of consistent um, UI that allows you to build things you know, very easily uh, utilizing our platform. Um, and also allows you to kind of build dashboards uh, to visualize your streaming data in real time as well. This is an example of a data flow. So when you think about stream processing, it's not just a single query running on a stream. It is an entire pipeline. And those pipelines contain multiple data processing steps. And it may well be that the streams generated at each point, those intermediate streams, are useful for other purposes as well. And typically we find uh, organizations that start with a data stream, start with a, 
a source of streaming data for one particular application, uh, use that for a lot of other use cases as well. Um, so not just the source streams, but the intermediate streams that you're creating as part of this processing can also be reused. And as I mentioned, we also allow you to do uh, building dashboards and visualization. Let's move on to kind of IoT. Um, IoT is crucial to a lot of industries already. It is going to be crucial to almost every industry going forward. That huge growth in IoT data doesn't just affect one industry, it affects everyone. And it amazes me that you know, an industry as old, established as the insurance industry, and so established that they use 500 years worth of data to determine where to build their headquarters because it's the safest place in the country. That industry is adopting IoT to monitor your, your driving habits, and I'm sure they'll use it to monitor other aspects of your life in order to provide the most tailored, most suitable policy um, going forward. And if it's affecting insurance, it's going to affect almost everyone. Um, agriculture, I think, will take that, get a big advantage out of IoT. But for IoT, it's essential to have a smart uh, architecture, and that smart architecture means that you are processing, well, collecting, processing, storing, analyzing the data where it makes sense. And that could be uh, within the device. It could be at the edge, so a collection of devices together, uh, but a small number of devices at the edge managed by an edge server. It could be on-premise, um, and it could be in the cloud. And all these pieces have to integrate together. The scale is obviously larger at this side. You have a huge number of devices. But the depth that you have and the view that you have into things increases as you move over to the right side because you're aggregating and looking at the combined uh, value of a large number of devices. And that could involve uh, correlating device data together, but most likely it's going to involve correlating device data with other enterprise data and doing that in real time to get the best value, whether it's through enrichment of that device data by adding context to it, like you have a device ID, you want to know what that device is, where it comes from, maybe you have to look that up in your asset database or integrate with your ERP system in real time. Um, or it could be that you are correlating it, you're looking for uh, events that are happening concurrently with your devices and logs from other machines, maybe security logs or other logs that might indicate something interesting is happening. So you need this kind of generic scalable IoT architecture that incorporates edge processing. And one of the things you have to remember with IoT is a lot of the devices out there right now are not I. They're not internet enabled. It's just a, a world of things that a large number of the things still need connecting. And so pretty often you need this physical gateway, a box that you have to plug wires into in order to actually connect to these devices. A lot of manufacturing devices, a lot of things like air conditioning systems, um, hospital kind of healthcare, uh, medical monitoring devices, they need to be wired. So you have to ask, how do you get that data? And that's where you need a protocol translation gateway to turn the communication with those old school wired uh, Modbus uh, backnet uh, RS-232 port devices into something that works for the internet. Um, you need to do edge processing and analytics, and you may also want to do machine uh, learning kind of model scoring at the edge. So build a model in the cloud or on-premise in your own data center, and then use the results of that model, move that to the edge, and do real-time scoring, and maybe do real-time uh, predictive maintenance or uh, quality monitoring or uh, any other aspect that you can model that you can say, is this behaving normally? Is this behaving as my model will predict? You probably also want to do processing and analytics uh, on-premise and move some of that through a hub into the cloud where you do more processing and analytics and maybe feed your machine learning and move that model back. And we built something like this uh, recently with some partners uh, where we use the Dell EMC uh, gateways, which are pretty beefy gateways. They have quite a lot of processing power and memory. Um, we integrated with the Azure IoT Gateway SDK to act as a protocol translation gateway that was talking to uh, Bluetooth and OPC UA devices. Um, we have the Streams Edge server that was actually doing edge processing and analytics, 
And we used Statistica uh, for machine learning, where we actually uh, built a model in the cloud uh, using Statistica that uh, was predicting product quality, and then scored that model at the edge to do real-time uh, analytics. So that's a, kind of an example of that architecture. There's lots of benefits to kind of an architecture like this. Uh, if you can switch out your protocol translation gateway, you can connect to anything. You can react immediately because you're doing it at the edge. You can do aggregation and turning data into information, remove, seeing the signal from the noise, uh, doing all of that at the edge so you limit the data sent to the cloud or into your uh, big data storage. You can scale it as required by adding more edge nodes, more on-premise nodes, more cloud nodes, and control everything centrally. So how do you handle this oncoming tsunami of data? So just to reiterate some of the guidelines that we've given you, first is transition away from batch. It is an artificial construct. The world is not batch. The world is event-driven. Batch was something that was a limitation of technology. So you need to move towards a streaming-first architecture where you are at least collecting data in a streaming fashion, but move towards in-memory pre-processing and analytics, especially uh, edge processing for IoT. Don't store all of your data. Data is not information. Um, if you have a Nest thermometer, it's sending your th temperature in the room every second, three and a half thousand data points in an hour. If your room stays at 70 degrees, that's one piece of information, it was 70 degrees for an hour. You don't need those three and a half thousand data points. So process at the edge, do filtering, aggregation, uh, remove redundancy before sending that to the cloud. And you do need a complete end-to-end -end platform. Open source it provides lots and lots of pieces, but it doesn't provide an overall solution. You'll still have to glue all that together. And most enterprises that we've spoken to, they focus on solving their business problems. Uh, I know Alex said that all businesses are software companies. That is true. Uh, but you have to choose how much of it you want to build yourself. So I will um, end there. And uh, I think we can go into kind of questions and a discussion. Thanks so much, Steve. I'd like to remind everyone to submit, submit your questions via the Q&A panel on the left-hand side of your screen. At this time, I'll mention that the slides from today's presentation, as well as a recording of the webinar, will be made available for download. We will be sending out a follow-up email with links to these assets within the next few days. So let's turn to our questions. Steve, you mentioned Statistica. Um, one of our participants was asking, uh, do we have a machine learning capability in stream, or do we have to prepare a third party something for using machine learning? So we have some degree of machine learning, kind of in a, but only focusing on real time. So for example, we have real time um, linear and polynomial multivariable regression algorithms. Uh, in our platform that you can train over a training window and then use to predict out into the future. And similar for kind of real-time clustering, but it's all limited to the amount of data that you can store in memory. Um, that's why we've partnered with companies like Statistica. And we've had customers also work with machine learning uh, software like H2O, um, where we generate and enrich data to get it in a form for machine learning. Uh, it's then trained and analysts work their magic and derive value out of that data, create a model, which is then exported. And typically, uh, they've been exporting them as JAR files, which we then can incorporate directly into our SQL. So you can then basically write queries within stream that reference the machine learning functions and do real-time scoring. Um, and that's kind of how we've done about it today. And if you have any particular machine learning software in mind, we can talk about kind of ways that we can integrate with that. Excellent. Thank you. This question is also for you, Steve. You mentioned uh, change data capture. Um, one of our participants is asking, can you compare Oracle Golden Gate streaming with stream? Of course, we're very fond of Golden Gate because the four of us that founded Stream, we were uh, on the executive team of Golden Gate uh, prior to the acquisition in 2009 by Oracle. But yeah, Golden Gate is great at doing database replication. It's great at moving data from one place to another. And they also do have kind of this big data adapter that can write the raw change data 
uh, somewhere else. Um, but we are a full streaming integration platform. And what that means is that you can do quite complex data flows, quite complex processing of the data. And very importantly, we can enrich the data by loading large amounts of reference data into memory uh, and do that in real time. And I mentioned earlier why that would be important for, say, uh, normalized data coming from database, right? Um, so I think it's, it's crucial to recognize that you know, different software is suited for different things. We are a full integration platform that can also do analytics on that streaming data and can also build dashboards and visualizations over that streaming data. Uh, we're not kind of limited to replicating data from one place to another. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Alex. Many of the computing enhancements of the last decade have been made in software. Do you think we're entering a period where hardware innovation will, again, impact the industry? Uh, thanks, Catherine. I, I do. I, we're, see, we're starting to see some smaller processors uh, come out. Uh, Google came out with its, its TPU. Last week, it, Intel has, has its NUC. Uh, quadrant, uh, Qualcomm is building a, a Snapdragon. People want to be able to do the the scoring part of of, of the of the machine learning out on the edge, and that's a big part of uh, of the stream processing story here that Steve's been talking about. A lot of the work that people are trying to do on big uh, big clusters in the data lake uh, on Hadoop and other platforms, they're realizing they need to do it out out on the edge, and and we're seeing a wave of innovation now with some of these uh, smaller uh, processors that are that are going into devices out on the edge. So I, I definitely think that we're going to see more hardware innovation out there, especially um, with, uh, with deep learning and artificial intelligence uh, becoming such big drivers of, of technology these days. Excellent. And that, in fact, Alex, there was a related question to that, and that was what, what will be the long-term impact of deep learning on the big data space, and what's the intersection of deep learning and stream processing? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the answer is going to be. Deep learning right now, from what I, I can tell, is, is mostly focused on solving a few problems. Image recognition, uh, you know, pulling uh, still photos off of uh, video feeds and trying to determine, you know, is that, a, is that a sidewalk? Is that a stop sign? Right? It's being driven by a lot of the autonomous car um, developments that are going on, and um, also voice recognition and natural language processing. Those, from what I can tell, are, are the main uses for deep learning. But I don't know, maybe Steve can talk about how, if any of that stuff is going to make its way into stream processing um, like and what he does. Also, segue into another question that came up there, and which was, how might data streaming be utilized in the healthcare industry, specifically our hospital? Well, I don't know which hospital is your hospital, but um, in, in general, there's a lot of possibilities uh, around uh, streaming data. Um, and you know, part of it would be around kind of patient monitoring. And we, we're involved, uh, it's an interesting story. You know, what's the commonality between hospitals and airports? It sounds like one of those bad jokes. The answer is wheelchairs. Um, <laughs> and wheelchairs have a big impact on the, uh, how airlines actually run on schedule and how hospitals move patients in and out. And so doing real-time tracking of wheelchairs and other equipment, uh, you know, like crash carts and uh, portable blood pressure monitors and all those things inside the hospital uh, could also be very, very useful. So you know where these things are immediately and you can optimize your, your flow. Monitoring patients, you put a bracelet on them when they enter, you know where they are at all times, whether they've wandered out into the fire escape or the restroom where you've lost them, you can find them, right? Um, so real-time tracking is, is important, but the other piece would be, uh, imagine a world where you combine uh, real-time biometric monitoring, you know, all of the things you're hooked up to when you're in a hospital, right? Um, and you can anonymize that data, you can send that into a, a cloud, and you can also uh, enrich that data with additional context, like the patient's uh, symptoms um, and you know treatment and, and other things right do deep learning on that again it's all anonymized there's no patient in specific patient information there right do deep learning on that now imagine you can then apply what you've learned in that deep learning to the real-time signals that you're getting from patients um, maybe that machine learning can spot something that might be a potential risk that isn't just you know 
you know, uh, an obvious sign that the uh, single biometric monitor would spot. So I think there's a lot of potential, a lot of things that people are looking at to kind of use real-time data and real-time data streaming in the healthcare industry. And that goes across all industries. Imagine you're streaming all of the data from your fields in agriculture, um, the soil quality, water content, sunlight, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things, right? Even monitoring with video cameras for pests and sending drones out to zap them with lasers. You know, so there's a lot of things that you could do in almost every industry, and it all relies on having up to the second information and being able to react on it immediately. Great. That was a very thorough response. Thank you both. Steve, this next question is for you. What data sources uh, does Stream work with? And a couple of examples uh, the person gave was Mongo or CouchDB. So we haven't, to date, put kind of real-time data collection for Mongo and CouchDB. On the database side, we support uh, change data capture, so real-time streaming of database change, the inserts, updates into these as they happen. Um, for uh, Oracle, uh, SQL Server, MySQL, and HP Nonstop databases. Um, that said, you can uh, source data from uh, Mongo and CouchDB through uh, other means. Um, which would basically be in the, the form of, of queries. You may have to kind of build something um, to work with some of these things. But in addition, we do read from uh, you know, log files in real time, HDFS, uh, Hive, um, also um, working with message queues like uh, JMS and Kafka, AMQP, Flume, and with devices through variety of protocols, TCP, UDP, HTTP, AMQP, MQTT, all of kind of the wired protocols. And we have some adapters for the protocol translation gateways as well. Um, so uh, sources of data means different things. Um, we can source data, for example, from uh, uh, JDBC databases in the form of queries, but typically for loading in memory data, our in-memory data grid for enrichment purposes. Um, you wouldn't want to do that for real-time uh, data because JDBC queries aren't real-time, they're a single result set. So you have to differentiate between kind of loading static data, which we use for you know, reference and context information, and kind of if you want to do batch in a streaming fashion, um, to real streaming data, which would go through change data capture. So as things are happening within a database, you're streaming that out. Excellent. Um, shall we squeeze in just one more question? Um, how does today's stream processing relate to older messaging techniques developed by, developed by TIBCO, Software AG, IBM, SAP, and Oracle that are still in widespread use? Can I take a step at that one, Alex? Um, you know, I think you might be better for this one. Steve, uh, obviously with your uh, history at Golden Gate, right? You're pretty well steeped in, in this stuff. So I mean, there's definitely messaging technologies out there, right? JMS has been around for years. MQ series has been around for even more years. And there's, a lot of those messaging technologies were typically applied to kind of application integration and kind of SOA, service-oriented architectures. And so inherently uh, are not necessarily designed uh, w with the throughput in mind and some of the other requirements in mind from a scalability, clusterability, uh, other things um, that will take the load of kind of huge amounts of IoT data, right? Um, so it, it's kind of, and that's possibly part of the reason why Kafka has kind of had such a uh, sudden rise in popularity. Um, but that, that's just half the story, right? The message queues is half the story. The other piece is the stream processing. And as I mentioned, something like complex event processing has been around for quite some time. And it used to be that it was you know, single node uh, designed for specific purposes, and the barriers to entry were really high. Um, it was difficult to get data in. It was difficult to get data out. It was difficult to um, visualize and kind of build dashboards over it and to integrate it with uh, other data. 
uh, to integrate it with reference data, for example, uh, that you load in memory. So I think one of the major things that is happening, and we are seeing that more and more, is is the integration of multiple in memory um, in memory components. So the combination of a high speed message infrastructure, in memory data grid, uh, in memory stream processing and analytics, uh, in memory databases, in memory visualization, in memory machine learning scoring, um, in memory transaction processing, kind of all of those things kind of coming together. Uh, to do a lot more stuff in memory. And part of the reason why that is possible now is because memory is getting cheaper and, and more available. And as we start to see new interesting forms of memory, uh, like you know, Intel's Crosspoint, which marries uh, the speed of RAM with uh, persistent storage, um, the amount of in-memory processing that you'll be able to do will increase astro astronomically, almost exponentially, um, which should help in memory processing help keep that help that keep up with the growth in data that we saw earlier. Thank you so much, Stephen Alex. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If we did not get to your specific question, we will follow up with you directly within the next few hours. On behalf of Alex and Steve, I would like to thank you again for joining us for today's discussion. Have a great rest of your day.